I'm going to talk about this uh, piece, um, Surface Tension, which I composed a couple of years ago for the uh, British showboyist Chris Redgate. Um, there are a group of pieces going back sort of three or four years now where I've been using uh, open music in the composition process. Uh, I'm for a long time, I wasn't using computers at all in uh, composition. Um, but uh, it really goes back to when I, uh, I had a postdoc with Brian Fernio in, St in Stanford back in 2002. And uh, I was looking for a way of um, <coughs> trying to formalize the composition process a bit more and uh, also find a way of allowing the material to proliferate um, in, in going many different directions while having some kind of formal coherence. And, th and uh, this is when I started getting interested in using open music. I also doing things with Max and live processing, but we'll stick to notation for today. Um, this, this is a, a structure actually from a, a p an orchestral piece I wrote uh, just after working with Brian. Um, this was all done by hand. This was before. Uh, using open music, but it was a, a structure that then lent itself to going into open music. Uh, I later implemented it uh, in computer. Um, for me, it was about fast generation of materials, finding a, defining constraints, and also I found interesting this tension between um, intuitive strategies and found objects. Just a brief description of what's going on here. At the top, you've got a uh, sort of nono-like uh, rhythmic series uh, taking the 16th note, the uh, semiquaver as a basic unit, and then a permutation of this set of primes gives you that duration series. The second one down is a random permutation of that. This is then taking a different permutation as the basis of the subdivision of the structure. And here, this is when I, it started getting interesting. Um, making subdivisions uh, conditional on uh, certain conditions such as if you look at, if you define at a given tempo the dur absolute duration of each of these uh, lengths of time in seconds um, you can see, you, and, and let's say an arbitrary number, five seconds and you say, well, I'll subdivide if the durations are less than five seconds, I won't if they're more. And you can see at a, at a slower tempo, you have less subdivisions, and at a faster tempo, you have more. And this, this is the kind of process which I... Uh, then, um, in a piece called Misguided, which I wrote for Elysium, um, this was the first time I, I, I implemented this in open music, and we can just see briefly the... Um, The resolution's not great. Okay. Um, I can just, you know, click on here and get hundreds and hundreds of these structures, and each one of them I can then you know, look at if I like it. I can export it and so on into Sibelius or Finale. Um, and uh, in a way, it moves the labour of composition to another place. <laughs> uh, and this interested me a lot. Okay, um, so that was the kind of first time I did this, um, and here's an early sketch you can see where um, originally this piece was a trio of winds, and the saxophone was added later, and you can see I would literally create lots and lots of these structures in, in, and start with this basic rhythmical structure and then compose on top of it, unless there are other things going on in pitch domains that were formalized, but I'm not too, I won't go into that in this piece anyway. Um, but there was a kind of clash in this case of the kind of overtone, a lot of overtone harmonics, particularly in the bass clarinet, and then using these formalized rhythmical structures. <coughs> okay, um, and this is what the score looks like. Um, I've got excerpts of all these pieces on my website, so I, I, if we have time, I'll play some excerpts at the end. Um, so, to surface tension, um, 
Cool. Chris, Chris Redgate is very interested in virtuosity and complex notation. And so it was really, um, in a way, I could be free to go as far as I wanted with this and know that he would um, be up to the challenge. This is a, a kind of later version of the, the patch I showed you before is in here. And then um, there's some further uh, substitutions. Basically, there are embedded lists of numbers which create subduplets, and then fill, and then I filter out some rests with other permutations of the same number series, and get a complex structure at the end of it. Um, I, can, I can just show you um, very briefly the whole thing in practice. And so, in a way, this programming, um, I used to do all this stuff by hand. And I can just you know click and click and click, and I create hundreds of these, and then go back later and choose uh, the structure that I was interested to compose with. Okay, um, and you can see this is the the there are two versions of this piece: one a duo version for oboe and piano, and one a version for which I wrote for cicada, which is an ensemble and solo oboe. And you've got the basic rhythmical structure on top. Um, and then, of course, you can see there's a lot further decisions to be made. So this is not in, in, in a kind of, it's not really generative music in any sense. This is very much out of time composition. Um, I just want to talk now a little bit about the pitch structures, because that was the next um, aspect. Chris uh, actually helped design a brand new oboe, this Redgate Howarth oboe, which has new keys and is designed for specifically for microtonal playing and has lots of multiphonics that don't exist on the standard oboe. And he had new fingerings, he sent me a whole list of these and hundreds of recordings and I went through and chose the ones just by ear that they're usually quite unstable sounds and um, probably Hello. No, decides not to play. Mm -hmm. All right. Sorry. Um, no idea why it's not working. Anyway, that's uh, using audio scope to analyze the spectrum, and then the next thing I did was uh, to um, I, I would. Uh, get a approximation of that spectrum um, as a chord uh, using very standard open music libraries and you can see the opening gesture of the piece here uh, which uses this multiphonic as the basis of the pitch structure with a um, quantized version of the chords. Okay, so that, that was in a way using the oboe as the sort of basis of the sonic uh, material for the piece. Um, the next thing I did was to create some artificial spectra using this. You've got a kind of this, cir this circle representation of the pitch space, um, in, uh, which is 90 quarter tones, which is around three and three quarter octaves, which is Chris has this amazing high register in the oboe. And I, I used this to create synthetic spectra. Um, using set operations in a sieve type operations a, la, a little bit like Tanakis did. Um, and this was how I derived the, these artificial spectra. And then you can see this is the first little uh, opening of the duo. You've got this, micro this uh, multiphonic spectrum here. Here you've got the artificial spectrum, and then here you've got a kind of hybrid of the two. And the, uh, these artificial spectra were built on from taking the low B flat of the oboe as the basic starting point. And so you've got this kind of found object, these two found objects, one having its origin in the oboe spectrum, and the other these uh, artificially generated pitch structures. Uh, and uh, Another go. Hmm. Do not know why that's not playing. I'll have a, I'll, I'll restart at the end. I'll reload at the end. He's playing earlier. Honest. 
<laughs> no. um, anyway, uh, this there's an excerpt on my website as well. Uh, try that in a minute. Um, <clears throat> of course, the piano is playing quantized versions, but in the um, in the ensemble version, you've got strings which can play the uh, multiphonic, the um, octonic structures um, in a more complex, more exact way. Uh, okay. So, uh, and the other thing I did was then using this interpolation object to go between the multiphonic spectra to the artificial spectra, or and back again in various ways. Um, and create melodic patterns based on these interpolations. So these are, this is not reinventing the wheel here, but just in a way showing how this program was, was, a, was a kind of natural extension of things that I was doing already. Um, and there you can see an interpolation of the... Um, that is a, is a spectrum derived from one of the multiphonics, and that's one of the computer-generated calls, but an interpolation between the two. Okay, um, and uh, if you analyze this closely, you can see that that structure I just showed you, the um, pitch structures around the, towards the end of the piece, are um, taking this interpolation idea that's, that that's where that technique really um, features. How am I doing for time? Um, three minutes. Okay. Um, so, and this is what the opening of the ensemble version looks like. Um, I'm just going to uh, briefly mention a piece I'm working on now. Uh, it's a piece for uh, the Cotto uh, di Timo of Paris. And, um, I use this interpolation idea uh, as the central piece of the architecture for this piece, but this time interpolating between artificial uh, spectral structures and, uh, and harmonic series. So it's a sort of quasi-spectralist idea. Um, in, in the uh, oboe piece, it was more of a kind of add-on uh, at the end, but now it's become central to the architecture. And uh, there you can see there's a there's an You've got a harmonic series at the end there, and an artificial spectra at the beginning. You've got uh, these very complex structures, but you do get a, a transition between the two. And this is what the string quartet looks like, and just as an example, the fifth chord, that one, is the basis of whoop, basis of this harmony. Yeah, and then you get towards the uh, harmonic series then a more natural spectrum at the end. So uh, just to conclude, um, I suppose for me it was a question of you know, why use the computer at all and why use open music. I was composing uh, by hand before um, perfectly well I thought. So why, why do I need this? Um, part of it was to get out of my habits and uh, have the computer present with a found object, something I have to deal with, which I just wouldn't have come up with myself. Part of it is, so it's not, some argue that it's a kind of relinquishing of compositional control. I think it's actually more enabling, because um, I've become very aware of the constraints I'm working in, and so how I can go beyond them. Uh, for me, composing intuitively means composing without subconsciousness of the constraints, conventions being used. Um, and uh, if we're not aware of these constraints, how can we go beyond them? I was interested in this comment earlier about composers and how um, the engraving process is often at the very end of the process. Um, but for me, it actually, this is now at the beginning of the process. Um, and. Probably the next stage for me is to bring these two elements together, the generative uh, approach to the rhythmic structures and the pitch structures, and perhaps joining the two together in the same patch. I haven't quite dared to go that far yet. Anyway, um, I'll just, I'm going to restart uh, PowerPoint and see if it will actually uh, play my... Um,
because it's a shame not to be able to hear something. Just give me two seconds. Okay, apologies. That's it. Thank you very much. Thanks.